One day, the devil walked into a lawyer's office. What can I do for you? The attorney politely responded. Ah, but it's what I can do for you, replied the devil. I can make you richer than Bill Gates. All you have to do is sign this little contract giving me your soul and the souls of your children forever. The attorney responded, so what's the catch? Think about it. This Sunday's homily is going to be about the catch and how to get free and stay free from its awful consequences. In today's gospel, our Lord gives his apostles authority over unclean spirits and we learn that the apostles went off and preached repentance and that along with this preaching and as a means of its authentication, they drove out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Indeed, time and time again, in the Gospels, our Lord and his apostles confront demons and the demonic, that is, Satan himself, a fallen archangel, and demons, fallen angels, in league with him, and, and in so doing, liberate and heal those held captive by their power in degrading spiritual tyranny. In fact, all the Gospels and the epistles of the New Testament assume the reality and validity of the devil, the demons, and the demonic. Jesus, at the beginning of his public ministry, after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, enters into a spiritual battle with Satan, conquering him. And later in his ministry, he reflects upon the time before he became incarnate. And he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The Apostle Paul admonishes us to put on the armor of God so that we may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. James teaches us to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, we are told, and he will flee from us. The Apostle Peter warns us to be sober-minded and watchful, and that is because as he tells us, our adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Again, the Apostle Paul teaches us that our real struggle in this life, our real battle, the real warfare, is not against flesh and blood, <clears throat> excuse me, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And the Apostle John tells us specifically in his epistles that the Son of God appeared, that is, became incarnate of the Virgin Mary for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, do you think that this point of view these admonitions and explicit instructions are for another time, a bygone era, and that they no longer apply to our lives, to your life, and to mine? If so, think again. Now I know that there are those who deny the very existence of Satan and the demonic, dismissing all of this as nothing but an aberrant psychology from an earlier time. I've even known some priests to do so, and they will have much to answer for. But given the Gospels, the Epistles, the cumulative weight of the apostolic witness, which is the Word of God, this simply won't do. Given alone those things which Jesus taught and did, with respect to the demonic, we are left with one of two alternatives. Either we must conclude that he, 
Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was deceived and or delusional, or we must conclude that Satan and the demonic are real. But as Jesus is the Son of God, consubstantial with the Father, the way, the truth, and the life, he can neither deceive nor be deceived. And he cannot consequently be deluded or delusional. And that is true no less today than it was in the first century. Furthermore, the words of the apostles, his apostles, were given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is God. So their words in scripture and tradition are the very word of God who cannot lie. Therefore, the logic of the matter, let alone prudence and common sense, compels us to conclude that Satan and demons are quite real. And subsequently, those who would deny their existence or explain them away are in fact deceived and delusional. Coming to grips with this vital and revealed truth is an instance of what is rightly called facing reality, not running away from it. Furthermore, the truth of this conclusion has been and is the constant teaching of the church that Jesus founded, alas, founded upon the specific promise, and this is not without import, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. <coughs> we see this, of course, in the church's life and teaching. For example, in her catechism and in her ritual. And when I refer to the catechism, I'm not referring to the catechism of the Council of Trent, although I could. That is the catechism of Pius V from the 16th century. I'm referring to the catechism of St. John Paul II of the 20th century. And in that catechism, we learn in its exposition that is explaining the Our Father when it comes to the petition, deliver us from evil, it teaches us that in this petition, evil is not an abstraction. We're not just dealing with general as an abstract reality, but refers, we are told, to a person. And who is that person? Satan, the evil one, the fallen angel that opposes God and his work of salvation accomplished in Christ, so that if we are praying with the church, when we pray the prayer, our Father, and we come to that petition, deliver us from evil, we are specifically asking, first and foremost, without diminishing other evils, to be delivered from the evil one. And in the baptismal rite or ritual, which we will celebrate this morning at this particular Mass, Every baptism rightly administered includes a form of exorcism which has already taken place today. Whether the one baptized is an infant of days or a grown man of many years, and this is crowned, as it will be today, by the explicit and public renunciation of the devil and his deceptive lies. Therefore, one of the chief benefits of the gospel of Jesus Christ from the sacrament of baptism flowing from its source, the sacrifice of the cross given to us through water in the name of the Holy Trinity is our deliverance, protection from and against Satan, his minions and their dominion, a spiritual domain, a spiritual realm of the dark, perverse and destructive things of the world. But, that having been established, we can move away from and outside the boundaries of that angelic defense against these spiritually dark, perverse, and destructive things. How, you may ask? The simple answer is, by each and every deliberate, 
mortal sin and repented of. But that being said, there is much more that needs to be said. Under the commandment, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And under the heading, which is below this exposition of the commandment, divination and magic, the catechism of John Paul II, and hence the church, especially warns us that all forms of divination are to be rejected. Recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future, consulting horoscopes, astrology, palm reading, interpretation of omens and lots, the phenomena of clairvoyance, and recourse to mediums all contradict the honor, respect, and loving fear that we owe the true and living God alone. Furthermore, the Catechism teaches us, and I'm simply quoting here, all practices of magic or sorcery by which one attempts to tame occult powers so as to place them at one's service and have a supernatural power over others is gravely contrary to the virtue of religion. And that phrase, gravely contrary, is very significant because it means the partition, participation, excuse me, in any of these practices constitutes, at least objectively, mortal sin. It also means we open doors by that participation which we then do not have the power, apart from God's intervention, to shut. And there are doors we should not open. They're meant to remain closed. In other words, through these and such practices, which are so commonplace and pervasive in our culture, and the entertainment and television is rife with them, we deliberately move outside that angelic defense received in our baptism. And so I would be remiss if I did not ask you that subsequent to baptism, have you deliberately or by association and the influence of others been involved in these dark practices? If so, you need to deal with these things. Because even if they are in the past, way back there, if they have not been properly dealt with, they and their consequences are still with you. And you deal with them properly by appropriating sacramentally God's provision for you and your family in the person and work of Jesus Christ. For, as Paul tells us today, in Him, it is in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, that is the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavishes upon us, which is a direct reference to the power of our Lord's work upon the cross. In other words, by drawing near to the true and living God through Jesus Christ and His cross, or the Christ of the cross, by going to confession, we remove these things from our lives, our families, and our homes. We deal with these things which frees us from their influence, their destructive power, and their degrading tyranny. A spiritual power indeed, but a dark tyranny. On January 29, 2014, then Monsignor Michael Olson was ordained bishop and installed as the fourth bishop of the Diocese of Fort Worth. For those that were present, you'll remember it, it was a glorious event. And one of the things that made it so, at his insistence, was the processional hymn 
one which you don't normally hear, the name of which is I bind unto myself today, sometimes known as St. Patrick's Breastplate, which set the tone and spiritual context of all that follow. It begins, I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of the same, the three in one, the one in three. This wonderful ancient hymn also includes the following stanza, which is as relevant today as it was in the time of St. Patrick when, through his preaching, the glorious liberating light of the gospel of Christ rose in its majesty, dispersing the darkness of the demonic world of the Druids of Ireland. It reads, and it should be read often, against all Satan's spells and wiles, against false words of heresy, against the knowledge that defiles, against the heart's idolatry, against the wizard's evil craft, against the death wound and the burning, the choking wave and the poison shaft. Protect me, Christ, till thy returning. Then following this is sung the crowning prayer, the real heart of the prayer which this hymn is. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. And then it concludes as it began, I bind unto myself today, the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one, the one in three. Can't you sense, and I know you do, the power, the real power, the goodness, and the holiness of it? This is the power of the blood of the cross, which alone has defeated and can defeat the Prince of Darkness. Herein lies our strong and sure defense for ourselves and for our families against spiritual wickedness in high places, such as the U.S. Supreme Court, and that prowls about seeking the ruin of souls, the eternal ruin of souls. It was so in the days of St. Paul, it was so in the days of St. Patrick, and it is so today in our land and in our lives. Let us remember the promises we made, and we will today. Let us remember the promises we made for ourselves and our children at the baptismal font. Keep yourselves, your children, and your home close to Jesus his Catholic Church, and his holy altar. For where the paschal blood is poured, death's dark angel sheaths his sword. Alas, by the infinite merit of the shed blood of Christ our Lord, made present in this holy sacrifice of the Mass, the unclean spirits are driven out, and you and yours are protected and healed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.